well uh, about getting into the terms of that uh, ruling but if you own a property in Adenta, Adrengan, Nola, Baaleshi, Medina and also the surrounding communities here in Accra you need to prepare to atone actually uh, for the tenancy with a new owner or face the consequences. This is because the Supreme Court has declared uh, that the family uh, which sold the land uh, did not own the property. The court has now uh, given the right uh, of ownership uh, to uh, one, one boy family and other relevant families uh, which will now engage all those uh, who bought the lands uh, from uh, the family and, and their contention is the reason for which I want to bring in uh, of course one man who was in court for us monitoring all of the conversation Richard Kojinyako who's joining us with the latest ruling and of course this has been uh, going uh, round on social media with many asking questions about the implication uh, of this very ruling but for the benefit of those who are uh, even about to hear of this latest ruling for now give us a background of what transpired today in court and why the court uh, presided over by the chief justice itself is coming to this determination well so um the genesis of this case dates back to the 1960s when the states compulsorily acquired some pieces of land 25 acres and then when the states acquires a piece of land like that under the compulsory acquisition compensations have to be paid and so the compensation claims, I mean, several groups started claiming that I am the one that ought to get the compensation and all of that. So it led to a court action. And so there were claims, counterclaims. And then in 1982, there was a judgment. The judgment, there was an appeal. So the appeals from one court to the other led us to this very instant case where they sought release from the Supreme Court indicating because one of the families asserted and claimed ownership of that particular piece of land and so they went into execution dispossessing people of that so the other faction went to court and so that is where we are now uh, and the question of, as to what exactly the court has decided uh, many are wondering what it is that you know uh, the effect will be but let's get to start with you know what the court has said about this very case well so blessed the courts made three declarations. Mm -hmm. The first one was the pronouncement and declarations made in favor of the numerous families and schools, most of whom are not parties to the instance suit, should be treated merely as declaratory. And that is the judgment of the court is not open, should not open the floodgates for attempt to recover possession and trigger demolition orders, particularly in relation to the grantees of the third defendant's family in respect of some of the lands that pronouncements have so far been made on and not falling within the scope of this judgment. So that is the first one. Right. The second one is all persons who have acquired grants from the Numo Mashi family in areas which by this judgment have been held not to belong to the said first and second defendant and third defendant family have taken possession of those pieces of land shall not be dispo dis dispossessed. So if you're already on it, the court's order is that you should not be dispossessed of your interest. And so they shall, however, atone tenants to the relevant stool of family as per the decision read by this court. But when they say atonement or atoning tenancy, right. it simply means that regularize um, your relationship or formalize your relationship with your new I land see. owner. The question as to uh, how many communities are being affected and if we are able to list some of them. Well, so uh, there are about 70 of these communities. You earlier mentioned some of them, Adri Gano, La Bawaleshi, Adenta, um, Pediasi, um, Ablikuma, and other places. So we have Pediasi, Botrasi, Mali Jano, Ayim, Kweman, Otopram, Obum, Danfa, Oche Konfo, um, Adenkrebi, um, Brekuso, um, and, and very far and very far reaching areas if you look at the list uh, right now uh, you know amounting to some if, if we might put it over 30 uh, in my view i don't know if uh, that's that's a correct estimation but, 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 of, but of some of the community 70, Seven, 70, 70. so that's even beyond my expectation exactly actually. and you have um, excerpts of that on your screens right now just giving you an idea of the areas uh, you know affected as a result of this very directive uh, so all of these areas belonging to one community no, or one owner no, not one, one right. owner yeah. so uh -huh. when the court directed mm -hmm. um, the lands commission to expunge the list of the previous ones because they were obtained through fraud mm -hmm. that means that they should get so it's not only one family you need to if you are 
a land or you own a property there, you mm -hmm. need to know who your tenant or your landlord is. Right. And so when you get to the Lands Commission, the Lands Commission will aid in this process. In fact, it's a process that has just been set in motion. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's what now the, unfolding, I believe. Exactly. And but, what, but that's why perhaps the uh, Lands Commission is also making uh, some, uh, you know, it's now, of course, incumbent on them to, to make some uh, more, to take some more action. Exactly. Uh, based on what the Supreme Court has said, because we understand that per the proceedings um, today, the Supreme Court is asking the Lands Commission to take a number of steps. Exactly. So the mm -hmm. steps are, so expunge the mm -hmm. list because um, it was obtained through fraud. But the second one has to do with people should not be dispossessed of their investment or property right. on that particular. So I, when we spoke with the legal experts in land, they indicated that if you own, for instance, a property there, do not quiver, do not um, be shaken. You're not what, necessarily losing that. Exactly. But it is just like you, Blazed, mm -hmm. you were my old um, landlord. Right. Now a decision has come that you are no longer my new landlord. And so the new one, we should have a new relationship. Right. That is atoning tenants. Well, will that in involve uh, payment of fund some funds? Well, um, so in law, they have stated that it is customary services, yeah. so you need to have a relationship with them. I do not know about the repayment of money yeah. bit, but you know in Ghana, um, when we had a chat, a conversation backstage, some people were saying that they live in areas where the land, the, the owners of the land, they've collected about, they've paid like three times, four times, mm. and then this decision has come as well. But the implication in all of this is that people should not be afraid yeah. because your land is not going to be dispossessed yeah. by anything. You only have to formalize your relationship with, with, your with a new uh, land uh, owner. The, the, the owner of the... I see. Uh, and, and Richard Kujinyak is uh, the one bringing us this latest as you see on the screens there with all of the communities. Some, uh, actually, because there are about 70 of them. So uh, all we're advising now is that um, you need to move to the Lands Commission get clarity on the area uh, where you are. We've given you an idea of Adringa, no, um, of course, La Baalishi um, and, and its environs, Adenta, Martina as well. Uh, so you might want to, if you're within that catchment area, deal with the Lands Commission exactly. and so, then get so, some clarity. So you see, uh, the property owners in like La Baalishi, you may not necessarily have one person who owns the land. So there are several a number of them. Yeah. So the judgment did not go in favor of only one family, yeah. but others as well. So and that is why the court indicated that other relevant families. And now that's why we're waiting on the Lands Commission to give us some updates. Uh, Richard Kojinyako, thank you uh, for providing us, uh, us with that uh, update uh, on the land. But again, we're sending that caution out do not let anyone threaten you. You are not being dispossessed of your uh, land. All you need to do is to contact the land uh, commission. I believe uh, you'd get uh, some detailed explanation to this and also uh, who uh, might probably be your new um, you know, landlord. So just uh, get in touch with the relevant authorities on that. And we will also be following up and bringing you updates in our subsequent but for now, inflation is falling significantly to some 26.4% in November 2023 uh, from the 35.2% recorded in October 2023. According to figures from the Ghana Statistical Service, food inflation was the major contributor to the decline in the rate of inflation. Food inflation uh, also uh, dropped uh, by some percentage points, uh, reason for which the Statistical Service has been providing some updates. Listen. For November 2023, the consumer price index stood at 198.2 relative to 156.8 that was recorded for the same time in November 2022. Consumer price index for the month of November 2023 stood at 198.2 relative to 156.8. Given these two indices for November 2022 and November 2023, year-on-year -year inflation for the month of November 2023 stood at 26.4. Year-on-year inflation for the month of November 2023 stood at 26.4%. This 26.4% 26 signifies an 8.8 percentage point drop relative to the rate of inflation that was recorded for the same for October 2023. In October 2023, rate of inflation stood at 35.2, and given the rate of inflation for November 2023, 26.4, we have seen an 8.8 percentage point difference between the year-on-year -year inflation for October 2023 and November 2023. 
this literally means that between the month of November 2022 and November 2023, general prices of goods and services went up by 26.4%. Between the month of November 2022 and November 2023, prices of goods and services went up by 26.4%. Month-on-month inflation that is between October 2023 and November 2023 stood at 1.5%, signifying a 0.9 percentage point increase relative to the rate that was recorded in October 2023. In October 2023, we saw a decline from 1.9% to 0.6%. This decline that, we've, that we saw from September to October 2023 has been reversed by a 0.9 percentage point increase between October 2023 and November 2023. From a trend perspective, we analyzed the year-on-year -year inflation for November 2023 over a 13-month period, that is November 2022, to November 2023, and same is done for monthly inflation on a trend perspective for the 22-month period, that is November 2022 to November 2023. Since November 2022, we've seen the sharpest decline in year-on-year -year inflation over the 13-month period, with the sharpest decline recording a change of 8.8 .8 percentage points between October 2023 and November 2023. For the fourth time in a row, we continue to see a decline in year-on-year -year inflation. Inflation started slowing down from July 2023. It slowed down to 40.1 percent, further slowed down to 38.1 percent and 35.2 percent for the month of September and October 2023, respectively. And for the month of November 2023, we've seen the steepest drop over the 13-month period. Isaac Kofi, uh, data analyst here, joining us, uh, joining us in studio with the latest we're hearing on the figures. 26.4% uh, from, you know, the good complaints, numerous ones we've raised uh, on this platform about how high that gone. 50 down to 40, yeah. 35 point, uh, you know, 5 there about. Good news, isn't it? Well, relatively good news. I mean, but where we want the rate to lead us to, probably we are not there yet. And if we are saying inflation is now 24.6% or 26.4%, it doesn't simply mean that prices are falling. It tells you that the rate at which prices are increasing, if you compare November 2023 to November 2022, it has actually slowed down. Mm. That is what this simply means. On a month-on-month -month level where the real picture is, prices actually went up by 1.5%. So it tells you that between October 2023 and November 2023, we saw some marginal increase in the price level. Right. And if you look at it, the government's decision was trying to try to explain uh, this for us to understand. And if you look at the data right from 2013, this is actually the lowest inflation uh, in 20 months. Yeah. The lowest inflation in 20 months, uh, where currently we are around, uh, you know, 24. Uh, point uh, twenty six point four point four yes at the disaggregated level if mm -hmm. you look at food inflation for instance yeah. it's still above the headline figure of twenty six point four food inflation currently is around thirty two point two percent but not and food inflation for, the, for, for this Christmas period you don't want to be hearing yes, about that we, we simply don't want yeah. to be hearing something about it but that's good news we've seen most of the big shops and the big organizations running promos. Yeah. So I am actually even anticipating that December inflation should come My down a bit. Mm -hmm. We can see some of these uh, seasonal factors influencing the December inflation. But importantly, when inflation is coming down, yeah. it is supposed to influence the policy rates, the MPC rate. But right now we've seen policy rates around 30%. And once policy rate plus T-bill rates are all above or all around 30%, it tells you that banks are still going to charge mm -hmm. their interest on their loans mm -hmm. about 30%. Right. And that's problematic. Once we see the policy rate coming down alongside inflation, mm -hmm. that is when the private person will begin to smile again. Because now when they go to the bank, because T-bill rates are below, let's say, 26 mm -hmm. or 25, then it means that banks will be compelled to also drop their rates and you can get cheaper loans. But we can have inflation come down, but if it does not move along with the policy rate and then the T-bill rates, 
uh, we surely wouldn't be at the point where we want to smile. Mm. But interestingly, anytime we have the inflation figures, you know, we've been talking about our top 20 yeah, items. Precisely. Uh, that all I recorded recall last mm. year, uh, some very interesting items yes. were featuring on the list. No need to belabor that point, but let's look at what's featuring this time around mm -hmm. on this very list. So there's actually one item that has been known since the beginning of the year mm -hmm. and it's featured more than six times or seven times, if I, if I, my memory serves me right. right. That's dog meat. Dog meat has it's still you don't here mean again. it. <laughs> well, it's, it's here again. <laughs> and you know, yesterday um, there was a debate in Parliament around how the prices of, of fish, fish yes. is going that, up. That that was a concern from Absolutely. the minority. Absolutely, it's, 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 it's here again. Right. And then mm -hmm. if you look at it, inflation for fish, sea fish is. It's about 50%. Mm -hmm. That of herring, smokefish, or amane is also about 50%. But let me run you through some of the top 20 items that recorded rates about 40 and 50%. Okay. Interestingly, tea bags actually in October was leading. It's still leading in November. Followed by country milk, prices are still very high. Carrot is still high. And, um, you know, ready made clothing for boys. Let's see. Yeah. yeah, this time around, not for girls. Not for ladies. Uh, yeah. This time around, not um, you know, underwear for ladies, but rather ready-made clothing for boys. But, but for the tea bag and, of course, the other item, mm. it's heavily dependent on imports. And, and I guess that's why Guta yeah. has been raising the point about the associated impacts on um, Forex and how our currency has mm -hmm. been performing over the period. In fact, it's, it's good. If you look at the disaggregated data, we've seen that our import inflation isn't that high, for instance. Last month, import um, uh, inflation on imported goods uh, was somewhere around, you know, um, it was a little bit above that. But this month, we are looking at 27.1%. Mm -hmm. It's above the national ab average. Right. But inflation for locally produced goods is also around 26.1%. All of them, uh, except for locally produced goods, is below the um, headline. And if you take a look at this, uh, th th alongside the projected um, you know, inflation target for by the end of year mm -hmm. 2023, we seem to be inching closer. Yes. But will we meet the target? Oh, yes. It, it, it looks as if we are likely to meet the target mm. because this significant drop in inflation. And then if you add the fact that... Yeah. Big shops are not running promos in mm -hmm. December. Mm -hmm. So we are anticipating that December inflation also drops significantly because right. prices are not, it's a festive season. Everybody yeah. wants to sell. Very so expensive. we are hoping that the seasonal factors plus what we've actually witnessed currently mm -hmm. uh, will influence or will, will determine yeah. um, whether we will be able to reach that target. But there's something that I, I want to draw your attention to which is, if you look at the whole inflation, there's this interesting donut chart or pie, um, pie chart that we need to look at. So all we, the statistical service looked uh, at um, some uh, 400 and I think 47,800 items. And among the 48.1% of these items all recorded a rise in price in the month of November. I see. So although the rate has so dropped, headline inflation might be down exactly, and yet if you go into the, you know the, the disaggregated the, form, the, yes, the, the, the items that we looked at, more than forty eight percent, close to fifty percent of these that, items, yeah. all of them yeah. recorded um, a change in price. Or just about um, nine point three percent actually recorded. And, and a that's why, in of price. course, I will be following up into the communities and also the marketplace to find out uh, what the impact has been. Isaac Kofiaji, thank you uh, for the latest. Uh, we're also paying attention to the story emerging from Parliament this afternoon as the minority is taking on the electricity company of Ghana for donating some 200 motorbikes to the Ghana Police Service. The National Democratic Congress MP say that they cannot fathom why a debt-riddled institution like the electricity company of Ghana will be seeking to take over the responsibilities of the state when they cannot even pay their debts to the independent power producers to keep the lights on. According to the former power minister and member of the Mines and Energy Committee, Dr. Kovna Donko, ECG's conduct is uh, the height of irresponsibility. I read with shock yesterday that the electricity company of Ghana had donated 200 motorbikes to Ghana Police Service. Ordinarily, any side donation would have attracted my applause. But in this with this particular donation, 
ECG has no business taking over the responsibility of the state to provide logistics for Ghana police. ECG is in debt to the tune of billions of cities. Indeed, two weeks ago, the Minister for Finance had to intervene to stop Seno Asogli shutting down because of ECG's indebtedness, indebtedness to IPPs. For an entity that cannot pay its debtors, they have no business donating motorbikes to Ghana police. It is the height of irresponsibility on the management of ECG to go donating motorbikes when they cannot pay their bills, when they owe so much, when the Minister of Finance had to step in to bail this country out of low shedding. Because Sona Asogli's 560 megawatts would have thrown the country into low shedding. He wants an investigation into the claims uh, that there could be corruption somewhat. It is high time that managements of state entities, especially commercial state entities, take responsibility for their commerciality. If Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority had done the donation, I would have had no qualms with it because they are profitable. But for a loss-making state entity that is throwing the future and security of this country into danger because of their indebtedness, to go donating 200 motorbikes is the height of irresponsibility. And I call on the minister, ministers for energy and the minister for public enterprises to call the ECG management to book. They should call them and whip them into line. Indeed, this donation must be investigated. It is not in the national interest and it will be surprising if it is not procurement driven. I am extremely disappointed as a former minister of power, as a member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, and representing the good people of Ghana in this house. Moving on to health, uh, the Ghana Health Service, uh, Dr. O o Joseph Obeng, uh, who is an official there, says that a move to get uh, public hospitals to use their internally generated funds to pay electricity bills is unrealistic. The medical superintendent of the if you are Quanta Hospital uh, indicates uh, that the public health facility are uh, already overwhelmed uh, with a myriad of challenges uh, which are affecting their daily operation. Uh, t tasking them to uh, pay their own electricity bills will only uh, compound the problems they have. We'll be hearing uh, from him shortly, but uh, first let's hear from MP for, for Tain, uh, who's uh, Adama Suleimana, who believes uh, that, uh, who actually delivered a statement uh, after the uh, major hospital in his constituency was disconnected due to its indebtedness to the tune of some 7 million Ghana cities. The oper operations theatre that directly serve the, that is directly connected to the central air conditioning system without which there is practically no area aeration within. The suggestion to put up a split air conditioning system will also lead to loss of Luminal or undirectional airflow in the theater. Mr. Speaker, due to the latest disconnection, the following is the current state of the hospital. All surgeries have been put on hold and have been restored to the Metals Hospital in Wenchi. All referrals to the facility are also being directed to nearby district hospitals. The Light Wave Health Information Management System. For seeing patients and prescribing, prescri prescribing can be used. Thus, patients are being seen on sheets of papers without access to their medical history and equipment. Water pumps within the facility is totally dependent on electricity and shut down within 30 minutes of an outage. Thus, taps are currently running dry in the facility. Communication systems are all linked to electricity, which have also been shut down. Mr. Speaker, I am by this statement calling on you 
and the House to urge government to, to take up the over 7 million Ghana cities bill, cost of electricity, to help maintain this modern facility, serving the good people of Tain and Bana districts. These districts are considered deprived and can't in any way take up the full cost of operating this facility. While well, speaking uh, to join us this morning, Dr. Joseph uh, Tambil indicated that implementing the directive will worsen the woes of public hospitals. Uh, NHI tariff and the directive that we should not charge anything out of pocket. There's no way any hospital in this country can pay uh, for electricity bills. It's just not possible. Um, as things stand, the MHI tariffs are so low that we can't even break even. Uh, and if you would avert your attention to this, look, for a common procedure like cesarean section, if you look at the market, the private facilities are taking between 8,000 and about 20,000. MHI pays us between 600 and 800 cities for one season section. So you can see that the gulf in, 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 in the differential. Uh, but we operate in the same market. We purchase the consumables from the same suppliers. And they don't give us any subsidy because we are public. Uh, facilities, and yet we are supposed to be charging so low, while others are charging so high. So it it comes to reason that the public and private can pay the electricity bill, but there's no way any public hospital in this country can pay the current uh, electricity uh, bill ranges that uh, we are experiencing. We take you now to Parliament where the Speaker of the House, Alban Babin, has directed the Health Committee to collaborate uh, with the power provider to find a lasting solution to this very uh, directive and challenge uh, we can hear from the Speaker. Uh, I'm happy to hear that power has indeed been restored to the facility. But um, I think I will direct that the Ministry of Health and that of energy should work together to find a lasting solution with regards to our hospitals uh, in relation to their electricity bills. Because hospitals, whether you like it or not, are considered to be essential facilities and they should not experience power cuts in whatever form. So I would direct that the Ministry of Energy and uh, Minister of Health should put themselves together and come out with a solution as to how this uh, electricity builds. Because uh, today is time that has come up, but listening to contributors, it, it appears it cuts across most of the hospitals in the country. And uh, again, based on the uh, recommendation, we will refer this statement to the health committee to also look into the matter. And still in Parliament, member of the House, uh, Medina, uh, for Medina, that uh, Francis Xavier Sosu has introduced uh, in Parliament a new private member's bill uh, which will allow for a two-day uh, holidays each uh, for Muslims uh, Eid, Eid celebrations. And currently, we know that the Muslims have uh, only uh, a day celebration uh, to, in terms of the festive occasions that they have in the house. The bill also makes uh, sweeping changes uh, to the Holidays Act, including a proposal that uh, on all of the holidays, uh, which holds between Tuesday and Thursday, they must be observed on Friday to increase productivity. Uh, Parliamentary Affairs uh, correspondent Kweku Asante is joining us uh, with the latest on this. And Kweku, um, has this uh, formally been introduced to the house yet? Well, Blazard, formally, this has not been laid in the House, but the clerk of Parliament 
has taken receipt of it and as, as, as we speak, it will go through the process of legislative drafting because what the MP is required to do under law is to notify the clerk of such changes he wants to make to the law and then the bureaucracy that exists in parliament to make changes to also draft this into a law will do that and so that has currently gone to the clerk of parliament it is going to go through the stages and we expect that before parliament we adjourn for christmas on the second of december this will come to the floor officially and it will be introduced to mp so that the, the actions will start but to go on to to give you the details let me talk about this new is celebrate. Like you said in your introduction, Muslims currently have only a single day for each holiday they want to celebrate. So when it comes to the Eid of Fitr, that is celebrated after Ramadan, there's only one day holiday, and the next day they have to be at work or be at school or be wherever else they have to be. When it comes to the Eid of Adha as well, they have only a single day. And the days after that, the days the day after Ramadan, for instance, is 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 the is the shak, and the day after the idol other is the tashrik. So these two days, the Madina MP, who is member of parliament for a largely Muslim-dominated constituency, is seeking to do this. So what he's seeking to do is that if this law is finally amended, Muslims will have two day holidays after idol fitr and another two days after idol other. And he says he's doing so because of the need to have a society where people uh, enjoy the benefits of the religion they do, and also the right to freedom, the, 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 the right to religion, I should say. And if you're Muslim and you're able to manifest that publicly, there comes some benefit that the state must, must, must give to you and the community. He believes that these two Muslim holidays will, 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 will help in terms of achieving this constitutional injunction. So that is what he's seeking to do with this. Let's and what reasons, uh, you know, is the MP adducing to support all of these demands? Well, he says that the right of every Ghanaian to freedom of religion is a fundamental one, and that in Article 21C, every Ghanaian has the freedom to practice any religion and manifest it. But the second dominant religion in Ghana being Muslims, they must have equal opportunities when it comes to celebration of religious festivals. And that after 13 days of mandatory fasting, they need an additional day to rest and to prepare for full activities. In terms of the other one additional holiday for Idol, Idol Ada, he talks about the unwavering trust of Muslims in the prophets that were given in the land of Islam. And that just a single day holiday does not allow Muslims to be able to celebrate and mark these religious festivals properly. And so he believes that two days each for these two festivals will indeed help for these Muslims to actualize their faith. Oh, I see. And how about the changes to the holidays? Huh? Well, so if you look at other other changes, yeah, very sweeping changes, Blessed. For instance, this proposal says that if any holiday falls between Tuesday and Thursday, that holiday must be moved to Friday. This bill is also seeking to take away the president's power to grant or declare additional public holidays. As we speak, the president under the Public Holidays Act, uh, 2001 at 601. It's allowed to declare holidays as and when it is. You know about the Family for Memorial Day and all these other ones. So this bill will seek to take away that. But the key of the key, the key part of the changes that we are likely to see if this bill go through is that if most, uh, if, if if holidays fall between Tuesdays and Thursdays, the proposal from the Madina MP is that that holiday must not be marked then. It must be shifted to Friday because of productivity. The other thing is that when holidays fall on the weekend, we know now that when holidays fall on a Saturday or Sunday, it is moved to the next Monday. Uh, the, 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 the number of parliament says that should not be necessary. And that if it's a holiday on a Saturday or a Sunday, that holiday should be marked and that the next Monday should not be made a holiday. I see. We are Santi joining us from Parliament and uh, of course uh, a lot happening on the floor even as we speak. You're watching the polls on the joining channel. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. The Eco-Conscious Citizens has petitioned the Inspector General of Police to consider dedicating a hotline to people who wish to lodge complaints about uh, noise pollution this uh, festive season. Joining us uh, in studio now is coordinator of the group, Awala Sawa, and uh, of course we'll be getting into the details of that petition shortly. Uh, but first on your screen is a copy of that uh, petition that uh, we know of that has been sent to the Ghana Police Service, raising a number of concerns. And you see that uh, pointing out clearly petition uh, for uh, the police to enforce noise laws. And it reads that the eco 
bunch of citizens are appealing to you uh, to use your good offers uh, to ensure that noise laws are enforced at all times and that we uh, have a peaceful Yuletide free from noise pollution. Now, noise nuisance is a criminal offence and enjoying the season should not be seen as an excuse to break the law and reduce the quality of life of fellow citizens. Uh, businesses can make money without inflicting noise pollution on their patrons and neighbours. The current noise level uh, in many parts of the country uh, from churches, drinking sports, social events, uh, commercial announcements, event centers to restaurants, uh, you know, hosting live bands in residential areas is often uh, unbearable. And noise pollution damages our health and causes noise uh, induced hearing loss. And it can also cause high blood pressure, heart disease, sleep dis disturbances. You also have the issue of stress, and it also reduces productivity. In addition, Noise pollution can push law-abiding citizens to take action, uh, which can have life-changing consequences. An example uh, is the recent shooting of a father and a son in Brooklyn, America, by a neighbor allegedly uh, driven over uh, by the edge uh, of noise pollution. So these are some of the concerns being raised in uh, the statement. Fortunately, Aulasa was joining us in studio uh, for a discussion on this. And Aulasa, thank you uh, for spending some time with us here uh, on uh, the polls. The point about you know, the festive season, and we know that so well, that a number of concerts uh, are lined up right from next week all through uh, throughout the rest of the year and then into the new year. But how can we really check this? Even, even before we get to the aspect of law enforcement, the, the point about personal responsibility, what's your expectation in terms of how we can check this? Well, my personal expectation is mm. that all individuals right. do their best to abide by the law. By all means, enjoy yourself. Right. By enjoying yourself isn't a license to inflict pain on other people. There are people who are not well, there are people who are ill, and uh, enjoy yourself, but be mindful of the noise um, levels. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that all through the year, we've received so many complaints by individuals from churches, event centers, drinking bars, so on and so forth, and unfortunately, yeah the three agencies who are supposed to enforce uh, noise abatement laws, mm -hmm. the police, the municipal assemblies, and the EPA, unfortunately, they don't seem to be doing enough to yeah. ensure that um, the citizens have a peaceful time. Yeah. And this the, is just not right. There's the question as to whether or not we could ever get used to this. Can, can we ever get used to you know, the level of noise uh, in the national capital? Well, we're not supposed to get used to crime. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen is that the proper level should be observed. Right. I mean, if an armed robber breaks into your house, nobody should get used to it. Right. But you see, when you are assaulting people with noise, it's tantamount to assaulting them with your noise. It's uh, not something that you should tolerate. It should be stopped. So there's enforcement. Enforcement is the best way of um, ensuring that we have peace. And let's be absolutely clear, it's not just a preference. It's not just about your ears. Right. It also can give you, as the doctors have told us, mm high blood pressure, yeah. cardiovascular disease, and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why every last Wednesday of April, um, <laughs> we have International Noise yeah. Awareness Day. And mm -hmm. the idea is to raise awareness about the damaging effects of mm -hmm. noise pollution. Uh, and for, for quite some time now, uh, you know, a lot of people have not seen this as crime or you know, violating the laws. They feel, well, if I have the speakers, they should you know, boom very, very loudly. Well, you see, if you're an event center and you want to make noise and harm your health and the, ha the health of those who've come to you, make your place soundproof. Right. And all we are saying that those who have not come to your establishment should not be assaulted and their health should not be affected by your noise. Right. If you are um, driving, would you like your driver to be somebody who hasn't slept because of noise pollution? Maybe that's why we have so many accidents. And... Uh, our main concern is that yeah. we seem to be allergic to enforcement. It's not just when it comes to noise. Right. It comes to building regulations. Mm -hmm. People build anywhere, yeah. mangroves, waterways, and the authorities just watch idly. They mm -hmm. do, in most cases, nothing about yeah. it. So when we are talking about the environment, we are concerned about the environment, not just about illegal mining, but we're also concerned about air pollution, noise pollution, mm -hmm. so that we can all have a clean, green healthy and serene environment. There's a reason why we're put in the Garden of Eden, which mm. was, by all description, a peaceful green 
place, not a I noisy see. place. We boom, boom, boom from yeah. dawn to dusk. And so this this statement that you've sent to the um, Ghana Police Service uh, and by extension the IGP, what, what's the demand really? Well, we want, first of all, the IGP, we are respectfully asking that yeah. he educates police officers. We've had several instances where um, residents who are being bombarded with excessive noise, it's, let's say it's 10 p.m., right. the EPA will not be open. The assemblies will not be open. The only agency that's open is the police service. They are open 24 hours a right. day. You go there and then some of the officers will tell you that this is not a criminal offence. They don't seem to be aware of Section 2968 of the Criminal Offences Act. So we want the, the IGP to educate them. Recently, we had somebody suffering from noise pollution going okay. to Dan Soman Police Station. According to him, he gave the name of the officer. I really don't want to call his yeah, name out. Right. But he told him that he wouldn't take the complaint. And this is wrong. Somebody is suffering from noise pollution. We don't want to drive people to the state that they will take the law into their own hands. So we want the police, first of all, to be educated that it's a criminal offence, to do something about it, stop the offence from taking place, and force the laws. That is what we are asking, especially during this festive season, where people think it's a licence to behave anyhow. Yeah. And the irony of the case is that um, all of these events um, sort of have some level of um, police protection. Well, not always. Yeah. I mean, you have people holding parties in their homes. Yeah. A lot of the nightclubs don't have uh, police protection necessarily. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is true that you have police officers sometimes passing by, hearing the noise, and it's quite clear that it's excessive, and doing nothing about it. But I said it's not just about noise. Sometimes you're driving in town, you find see somebody going through a one-way, and sometimes the police just watch on as if this is something that... They it's can't not. do anything about. So I keep on saying that we seem to have um, an allergy when it comes to enforcement, not just noise, uh, nuisance laws. Uh, why do you feel there's this um, sort of neglect about this issue of uh, noise pollution as compared to, you know, the usual sanitation issues that we have and the other problems that everybody keeps advocating for and, you know, talking about? Why are we not, you know, fixated on the issue of noise pollution and, and the potential harm it could cause to our health? Well, first of all, Maybe it's a bit of, um, I don't want to use the word, but maybe a bit of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Maybe the doctors should be more uh, forceful in letting us know that hearing loss is a bad thing. Not being able to hear what's going on around you, it puts you at a disadvantage. Right. But there are worse things that could happen to you. You could have a heart attack. So the doctors should speak out more because maybe people are ignorant and they sort of think, oh, it's just noise. But the number of people who have complained to us because... Um, the relevant authorities are not taking any notice. It shows that so many people are bothered about noise pollution. And it's about time the authorities did something. But let me say that yeah. and keep on repeating that it's not just noise pollution. You have building regulations. Mm -hmm. You're building a house. You're supposed to have a place of convenience. How many houses do we find that don't have any places of convenience? And people use... Uh, whether plastic bags, whatever, and the building of the inspectors do nothing. You can do an audit, go around houses, and you can find out those that, first of all, don't even have building permits, and then those don't, that don't have places of convenience. And that's causing a real danger mm. to people. But we seem as a country to just look idly by until maybe the person has offended somebody, and then maybe we will come down with the law. But we are saying that enforce laws at all times. The environment is not just about... Um, you know, Galam say, it's yeah. also about noise and uh, the air that we breathe. Uh, and we need to also point out that this is not the first time you're raising this concern. Um, uh, I think earlier this year, there was a similar concern or petition to the IGP. It, so, so it's not just a December or a Christmas uh, challenge. No, it's all year round. And I must say that the IGP did do something about it because one of the borough commanders called us for a meeting. He had right. received a circular from the IGP. So some people have been responsive. Others are still not, being, um, not taking it seriously. And what it is is that causing a lot of pain to residents. So yes, we commend the IGP. He has started, but there's still a lot of work to do. And we are asking for a dedicated number, mm -hmm. just like you have a number for the... For uh, how would you want that work? You know, well, we want a number yeah. that mm -hmm. residents can call. It's 2 a.m. It's 11 p.m. There's noise pollution. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to call a number, and the response team will come and deal with the situation. Because, you know, it's not something that we should take for granted. All year round, I mean, we are bombarded with noise pollution from these establishment churches mm -hmm. who seem to think that God is deaf. 
Some of them are just charlatans because when you read the Bible, it's the prophets of Baal who were making so much noise. You're praying to God, what is the reasoning for screaming as if God were dead? Sorry, we're deaf. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just uh, pray mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that your noise is not causing offense. Mm -hmm. Because what you could be doing is putting people off the gospel by the way you behave without showing brotherly love to people who are trying to catch some sleep. Okay. Uh, and, and once more, let's, um, you know, touch on the issue or the aspect of uh, personal responsibility. Because once again, even without a please, that, that's, you know, the fastest way of dealing with all of these uh, challenges, having respect for your neighbor and, and, you know, just assuming how they are you also feeling when you are making all of these noise. Do, do you feel that people are conscious of this, are aware of this? And how do we reverse A lot this? of people yeah. are selfish. And there's a saying that says that people do what you inspect them to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are some people, like I'm sure yourselves, who are law-abiding. You don't need a policeman to do what is right. There are some people who are like that. But you see, mind you, even if there are 10 people and only one person is making noise, that's 1%, that it affects person everyone. is going to disturb yeah. everybody. Right. So the best way of making sure that people live up to their social responsibility is for heaven's sake, enforce the laws. Laws are not supposed to decorate statute books. They are supposed to be enforced. And it's not a question of not putting a human face. It's a question of there's a reason why we took the trouble to pass laws, regulations, mm -hmm. by laws, mm -hmm. and for heaven's sake, enforce them. The EPA has made several announcements, I think yeah. even last year, that they were going to patrol and so on and so forth. We don't really know what came out of it because mm -hmm. those who are suffering are still suffering. We need the EPA to tell us what happens to complaints that are made. Mm -hmm. When they have the enforcement, what exactly are they enforcing? Because people are fed up. People are dreading yeah. this. Uh, and speaking season. of the EPA, uh, what more should be expected of them th this uh, period, uh, knowing that this is also a Christmas or a festive season where uh, a lot more of the concern you're raising will, will come up? Uh, we've not seen any policy lineup or program that, that seeks to suggest that they will be doing something about noise pollution in this time. Well, I know that the um, EPA had made... Um, some pronouncements a few months ago about asking the communities to work together with them okay. um, regarding pollution, including noise pollution. But for that to happen, they need to know that when they make complaints, the complaints are taken seriously. I've got so many instances, again, I don't want to put it on air, where the enforcement team has been called, specific persons have been called, and they have done absolutely nothing according to the reports I've written. I also have my own complaints. Right. So what we are saying is that the EPA should rise up to its responsibilities. Noise pollution is a criminal offence. Okay. The EPA has a mandate to, to deal with noise pollution. For instance, before you set up a church or these establishments, you, there's supposed to be an environmental assessment. Mm -hmm. So once you haven't done that, you are, you are operating unlawfully. Half of these churches and establishments or event centres don't even have licences. The EPA could close them down. I mean, the EPA, EPA has teeth. They need to let Ghanaians know that they are serious about enforcing regulations, not only on noise, but all the regulations that they, they are able to But, but in some areas, there's, you know, the difficulty about planning and layout of the community. And, um, you know, when you go to some of the residential areas, obviously, um, you could easily identify the source of the noise or isolate the area and then, uh, you know, get the culprit. But that would not be possible, <laughs> close to impossible in some, uh, you know, uh, cl close to impossible in some of the communities, um, you know, in, in layouts that, that have, uh, you, well, you might want to call them slums. Uh, you know, uh, it would be a challenge identifying the culprits in, in those areas. Well, you see, where there's a will, there's mm -hmm. always a way. And even in the areas where there's no challenge, I yeah. mean, yeah. again, next time I come, I'll name and shame. Right. But in this particular case, I'm not doing that. Right. There are establishments in Laboni, in so many different Jowulu, so many different areas mm -hmm. where the culprits are clear. Yeah. The establishments are clear. Complaints have been made. The only thing that needs to be done is action taken, and no action is being taken. The complainants just keep complaining, and the relevant authorities, whether the assemblies, the EPA, do absolutely nothing. They warn the, they warn the noise makers. Mm -hmm. Warning them is not enough. You can close them down. Once you close them down, others will begin to understand that Ghana is a country where laws are enforced. Mm -hmm. But as it says, it seems like you can do exactly what you want to do right. once you're well connected. Uh, we need to go. Uh, if there's anything our audience needs to know about noise pollution and perhaps the leadership of the Ghana Police Service, what, what do you want to leave everyone with? 
Noise pollution harms your health and also reduces productivity. Do not tolerate it. Make the complaints. If it needs eventually taking individuals to court for uh, dereliction of duty, so be it. But please do not tolerate damage to your health. Noise pollution damages our health. And we appeal to the IGP to educate officers, let them know that noise pollution is a criminal offence, and let us have a dedicated number that we can call when there's noise pollution. Thank and you that, so much. And that's Awolasa, our national uh, coordinator for the Eco Conscious Citizens, joining us here uh, on the polls. Uh, but it's time to talk politics. The National Democratic Congress is uh, committing to instituting some regulations that will enhance and also enable chiefs participate in the protection of forests in the country. Now, flag bearer of the NDC, John Travani Mahama, explains that the present order where the Forestry Commission has absolute responsibility has proven ineffective. According to him, there is the need for stringent measures to protect uh, the remaining 18 out of 37 forest reserves. The former president is on a tour of the Western North region. Nanaya Ajima has been following. The Building Ghana tour by John Mahama was well received by the people of the Western region. After a meeting with party officials, the former president made a stop at the Rioso Palace to pay a courtesy call on the traditional authority Chief of Rioso, Katechi Kwesi Bumangama II, bemoaned the fast depletion of forests. And then, uh, President Oba, Unya Kwaye Biam Fa and Kanwa Semu, say you were quiet. You knew quiet. Kakanon so I can also, Umugu Susan. And Tim de Massim here, here, Miss Obano. San Norman and Peso will address my. The Western North region hosts some of Ghana's rich forest reserves, but illegal logging and irresponsible mining are causing a fast depletion of the forests. Mr. Mahama, who is alarmed at the devastation, is proposing legislation that will give traditional authorities some supervision over forest reserves. But I see I be ma na na no mo any forest for no any be was that to be no say omo hwe kwaye no so am say eh yes sir be ma yetimi abo e kwaye no ho ban chen say aban ejuma en fo kwa ene hwe e to de bia omo anka sa ene eh omo omo say kwaye no ene ye e kana na e ko twa ndua no ana so omo ko to go e wo the traditional authority expressed worry at the waning power of traditional office he wants the next NDC government to restore lost authority. Politicians, no, Maji, you two million free and some. Maji, you two million free and some. Society, you know what you're doing. And there, you're best some old big crowd in fear. But to me, tell me, you're catching the young farming cocot. I can't know to me, cancer. And to say, you were as well as some baby mother. You're called National House of Chisina, you can't. And you want for you to me in my own for you to me in my and so the two men to me in my idea and they are him for you I will be dinner the former president responded to the request at a town hall meeting later in the day say about our constitutional review now yes yes I said no you bet to us so now say your friend me padu do on a him for back home Na yeng na be chere adre, emse ho ena asema okaye, e wose yechim constitution don, na yechimi di shim. If you say di shim wa, obi intimi kwa Supreme Court enko kase, de bi, o heni ni e kwa inse, obe fremi ya na ebi bi. Se o constitution mu dea, ene e chere se, o maini yina ena adre ya tum. The tour of the Western North region continues on Thursday. For Joy News, Nanaya Ochima. Western North Region.
And in the Ashanti Region, Education Minister Dr. Yaose Educhu has doubted his achievement uh, of his ministry in placing some 95% of the 2023 junior high school graduates into various senior high schools despite challenges encountered during the school placement process. According to the minister, 81% of students were automatically placed into their selected schools with 19% depending on self-placement. Addressing the press after giving an account of his uh, achievement to the Ashanti Regional House of Chiefs general meeting, the minister indicated that the enrollment made this year has become the highest recorded in the few, uh, over the last few years. Nana Yao Kwachi Adam has the rest of the story. The last general meeting of the Ashanti Regional House of Chiefs, chaired by the Asante Hini Utunfo Seitutu II, invited the Education Minister Osei Yawaduchum to give an account of government's achievements in the sector. Several issues were addressed by the minister, including challenges with the 2023 SHS placement. Admitting to the challenges, the education minister, Dr. Osei Yaweduchum, says 95% of JHS graduates have been successfully placed into various schools, the highest in history. We've had a great opportunity of boosting um, what the, uh, the placement of students. You know, over the years, when you do the release, uh, you may have about 30% of students not getting a school. And they have to go to the self-placement portal to look for a school. This year, we were able to do 81% automatic placement. These are students who received the schools of their choice. And they were only left with about 19% of students who have to go to the portal and look for a school. So there has been a vast improvement. In fact, we've been able to place 95% of all the students who qualified to be placed a major accomplishment this year. According to him, the government is committed to improving the educational sector. We have uh, new high schools under construction, science labs have been built in existing schools, uh, WASI schools across the country we know has improved and literacy rate which used to be two percent for primary two students in 2015 is now 38 percent there's no doubt that we're seeing a major transformation stem education has been given a great boost the asante hino to say to the second however charged chiefs to inspect the educational infrastructure and its progress in their communities English and mathematics were cheche mo. Zero. Computerized the year edit a yin kola yin uno se de zitiye. Zero. The minister has explained everything to us, including the issues concerning the school placement. He has said a lot. What we have to do as chiefs is to also inspect the infrastructural projects in our communities. It is our duty to do so. Zero. So one particular thing that came up during the meeting with the education minister is the whole conversation surrounding the cancellation of the teacher licensial exam, which was brought up by the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Dramani Mahama. Well, the Asante Hino was quite particular about this whole conversation surrounding the cancellation of the teacher licensial examination. The education minister highlighted the importance of this whole teacher licensial examination. He calls for a non-partisan dialogue in addressing the concerns. From the National House of Chiefs Auditorium, my name is Nana Bwachi Dankwe Yadom. Kumase. And now to our tech test, the well, occasional disputes between customers and bus conductors over transport fares is a... A uh, common place in Ghana. Fortunately, an electronic payment system seeks to avert the situation on Tech Test. The Lava Femme's uh, Clinton Yabua explores the innovation that could be the arbitration of transport fares and the disputes. In Ghana, taxis and trotters are important means of transportation for about 60% of the traveling public. Inaccurate charges and disagreement over the phase notes arise from the traditional method of paying transportation fares with cash. The tap and hop technology is reshaping this narrative with electronic payment solutions offering an efficient alternative. The point-of-sale device installed in a taxi or trotter goes with a corresponding e-switch-like card to activate transactions electronically. Passengers are assigned to a special card 
The card is loaded with money for mobile money through the Tap and Hop app. Emmanuel Arthur is a front-end engineer at Tap and Hop. Then when you go into the car, you just tap on, so it starts your journey and then it records the GPS location of where you start your journey and then also when you get to your destination it records the, the, um, the GPS there, it calculates the exact fare that you use to pay using your cash then you pay through the card. So the convenient way is that you first load your card, uh, card through maybe mobile money or bank account. So the card, uh, your money gets sent to the card. So when you tap on, it records your, your journey. Then when you get off, it deducts the exact money from your card. Too. So when you get in and you don't have money on the card, when you get in and tap on, it will show you that uh, something went wrong or you don't have insufficient balance in your card. So this is one thing that if you don't have money on the card, it will show you. But if you have money, when you tap on, it records your, you start your journey. Then after that, when you get to the place that you're going, you get to deduct the, the exact transfer of the, uh, tra uh, the commute that you, you've done. So this came as a force to drive the digitalization age where we have witnessed that uh, digitalization is being dri uh, the driving force for every nation. So this is an initiative to also help um, bridge the gap between like the Western world and ours. All right. So we brought up this in um, initiative just to also provide the assistance for traveling issues, where a passenger or a driver will be having issues commuting their journeys. One, you don't have to hold money so that maybe somebody can take the money away from you. And also, two, to provide assistance that maybe you don't, um, you don't have smaller denom and denomination of the cards, all right, so that you avoid the go back and forth of you and the, the mates having issues. That also will solve that problem um, with you. And also, it also provides the assistance for the drivers to also have the easy way to collect their money because you don't have also have to go back and forth with the passenger to get your money. And sometimes, even though some passengers will also run away with their money, where well, you don't get access to know. So this initiative will also solve the problem of getting back your money when they run away. So whenever they bought a card again, the money will be deducted and will be sent to you with the driver as well. Again, the device ensures passengers' safety and protection of passengers' personal items. When you when you get your items lost in the car or like when the car takes your items away, you will get the chance to also call the driver because you have the driver details in the app. So when you go to the app, you find the driver that you bought the car, then you take the driver information, call the driver, say my this thing um, something has been uh, lost in your car, then you retrieve your, your things back. So that's also one easy way. Reporting for Joy News, Clinton. And up north, the people of uh, Nakwaili, a farming community in the Nanumba South District of the Northern Region, have uh, heaved a sigh of relief following the construction of an ultra modern maternity ward for the only health facility in the community to support the expected uh, mothers, uh, expectant mothers actually during delivery. Prior to the construction of the maternity ward, the expectant mothers in the community used to travel to very far uh, communities such as Wollensee and uh, Bimbila to access healthcare delivery. We have more in this following report. The construction of this maternity block is to provide emergency obstetric care for about 30 communities within the Nanumba South District of the Northern Region. The aim of the facility is to improve accessibility to skilled care and thus reduce morbidity and mortality for mothers and neonates. The Abuya Foundation, the organization that constructed that ward, conducted some studies and obtained report of positive impact on the outcome for women and their newborns. Alhaji Aminu Idrisu is the chief executive officer of the Abuya group. But what informed the maternity was that um, when we were commissioning the mocks uh, somewhere last year by this time, um, the community already, they, don't, they, they, they were not having a maternity. So if a woman is giving birth, they have to send the woman to Bimbala or Wulisi. And then by so doing, some people will deliver on the way, some people will deliver and have complications and all those things. And then um, and during the commissioning of the mocks, I've, I've realized that one of our guys wife were rushed to uh, Bimbila for delivery, which they informed me during the uh, distance. So I pray to God that uh, God should 
help us to get the maternity. The midwife at the facility, Jennifer Akuto, explained the impact the maternity ward would make in the beneficiary communities. When I came here 2021, because the place, our delivery room, we have only two beds for the delivery and our catchment area is large. So when the ladies come like that, because the beds are only two, no, we are not able to com uh, accommodate some of all of them. Sometimes we have to contact deliveries on the floor because there's no enough beds for us to. And after delivery, we have only two beds that that is our lie in that they can come and lie and then we monitor them for the six hours. So because the beds are only two, we are not able to monitor our uh, postpartum mothers after delivery up to the six hours. So sometimes when they deliver and you monitor them two, three hours, you have to let them go and give space for the others that are to uh, deliver. National Chairman of Opposition NDC, Johnson Asiedun Katia, who was one of the dignitaries who graced the occasion, lauded the CEO of Abuya Group, Al Haji Aminu Idrisu, for using the corporate social responsibility arm of his companies, Abuya Foundation, to touch lives. We heard about the story of Al Haji Abuya beginning from the construction of a school for his community. Then he followed to construct a mosque, that is a prayer house. And today, he has completed a maternity ward, which signifies the beginning of life. So all the three key projects are projects that have been carefully selected. And I want to thank him from the bottom of my heart. The chances of women dying because of complications of pregnancy and childbirth are still high in many parts of Ghana and around the world. With the construction of this ward, the story of these communities is about to change for the better. For Joy News, Samuel Kodjobrace, Nanumba South District, Northern Region. And authorities at the Kintampo College of uh, Health and Wellbeing are appealing to government to help upgrade the school into a university state of speaking. At the 8th graduation ceremony of the school, Health Minister Kukwa Jumamenu indicated that all necessary documentations have been carried out to facilitate the upgrade and government remains committed towards improving health education. Nana Savit has the rest of the story. It is the eighth graduation ceremony of the Kintampo College of Health and Wellbeing, an institution established in the year 1969 with a mandate to train middle level health professionals to provide quality and comprehensive health care to the populace, especially those living in the rural and underserved communities. The school today runs 15 undergraduate and certificate programs and can boast of a student population of 6,480. Director of the college, Dr. Kobna Opoku Eduse, in his address said despite the school's efforts towards achieving the school's vision of becoming a world-class health university that responds to the health needs of communities, the lack of adequate infrastructure continued to be a major challenge for the school. Now, some of the things that we request are physical infrastructure, cost of residence, lecture halls and teaching aids and equipment, staff accommodation, Completion of the abandoned Get Farm project, which was supposed to house 400 students. And then we also request for upgrade of Kentampo Municipal Hospital into a teaching hospital level. We also need transport, human resources, adequate staff of all categories, as well as staff faculty development. Part time lectures have become very expensive. He further appealed to government to allocate resources to the school to enable them execute their mandate. The ministry is developing conditional service documents. I hope that our unique school will be given unique cover because we are unique. And just remind all of us that we are not a nursing and military school. We are unique and that can be taken into account in all other resource allocations and other uh, issues that come to the headquarters. 
chairman of the occasion and paramount chief of the Nkranza traditional area, Nana Kwame Bafo IV, made a special appeal to government to convert the college into a university status and advise the graduates to prepare towards the realities of life after school, adding that they'll have to go the extra mile to be able to deliver efficiently. Ladies and gentlemen, health training institutions such as the Interport College of Health and well-being play a no mean role in the healthcare delivery in this country. And it is important that we position to fulfill their mandate. The college has a history of excellent outcomes in the training of health personnel for the country. And I want to make an appeal to the government to consider upgrading it to a fully fledged university to train the needed professionals with the needed skills and uh, capabilities within the middle belt of our country. Wow. Special guest of honor who doubles as the Minister for Health and MP for Doma Central, Kweku Ejman Manu, reiterated government's commitment towards upgrading the institution into a university status. And it will facilitate teaching and learning in the college. We're looking forward to upgrade to university status. We haven't completed the process yet. But I know gradually we will get there. This is an old school, very large facility. Houses close to over 5,000 students. And I believe this is the way we should go. The eighth graduation ceremony of the Kintampo College of Health and Wellbeing was held under the theme Achieving Good Health and Wellbeing for All, the Need to Upgrade the College to Investing Status. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Kintampo. And back here, uh, friends and families of the late astute lawyer Kutampa are reliving memories of his life as Sam described him as a man of principle and diligence who lived for the good of others. In less than 24 hours to his burial, friends and families of the late lawyer Kutampa are gathered to relive his uh, fond memories, uh, the, the, the remembrance service uh, which took place uh, at the National Theatre last night saw tributes from many who described the lawyer as a man of principle who lived his life uh, for the good of others. My colleague uh, James Aveji was at the event. <laughs> Born Anthony Yao Akutuampao in 1950 in Lolobi, Sheshe, as he was later called in life, was one of a generation who cut the niche for himself in the practice of law. Lawyer Akutuampao, in his 73-year life journey, was a man of many parts, an accomplished lawyer, political and human rights activist, a footballer, music lover, and many others. His political activism started in his days at the University of Ghana where he joined the National Affairs Discussion Group in 1979, a group which later evolved into the New Democratic Movement and later joined Jerry John Rawlings' PNDC for the 31st December Revolution in 1981. For a man who was loved by many friends and family, have gathered here at the National Theatre to painfully relieve some fond memories they hold of him two days to his burial. Professor Sowa Mensah was one of his roommates at the University of Ghana. When in the early 70s, some of us, the close friends, through sports, made sure that our lectures ended by 2 p.m. because we had to start with table tennis and then go to soccer and go to the athletic field and go to basketball. If we went to basketball, we come back, take showers, do whatever we needed to do. 10.30 p.m. we meet in Shea's room and we could be there till two in the morning. Shea was a very, very good musician. His musical skills were way above average. Shea played guitar and in our group, we never performed outside. We just played in Shea's room. We'll play Crosby, Stills and Nash, Simon and Garfunkel. We'll listen to Led Zeppelin and so many other musicians. He was a very accomplished guitarist. One of the things we did was to go to parties. 
and you've heard a lot about him partying. But we didn't know where the parties were. All we needed was somewhere in North Kanishi, there was a party going on a Saturday night, and we moved from campus about six, seven, or eight. And we were doing the gospel according to the sound. We'll walk around North Kanishi with our ears open, listening for where the party sound is coming from. We always found the party place. But sometimes it took about two hours of walking to find where the party is. Comrade and close ally to lawyer Ampao, Kwesi Pratt Jr. says he was the fine brain behind most of the aluta that caused positive change in the early days. And indeed, my witness is Akunu Dake. We were then publishing things that would be considered subversive in those days. And we needed to find a place to print them. And we had this old Stycho machine. And we decided to put that machine in the boys' quarters of Akunu Dake for good reason. Because he was still a public servant and publicly perceived to be loyal to the regime. Nobody was going to his house to search and find the things that we were doing. And it was Shisha's brilliant idea that this old stycho machine should be planted in Akunu Dake's boys' quarters. And Shishi, unlike other leaders, would spend the whole night from about 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. just rolling the machine never got tired. The other thing about Sheshe, which is also extremely remarkable, is that he never got tired. So we would meet up to about midnight, and then in the morning by 9 a.m., Sheshe's statement, embodying all the things that we had, discussing, we had been discussing the night before, would be ready before us. I can again say, that in spite of the information which is available in the public about who did what and so on, Sheshe was the engine of Alliance for Change. Again, he wrote more than 90% of all the statements we issued, including those who were read by Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. Fondled her memory and love like a long lost and now new found heirloom worth the premium value of my soul. Sheshe was a man who close relatives say knew how to make time for friends and family and his special fufu and bunubunu delicacy. Despite the load of work, Princess Fatih and Kuma described him as an uncle whose love for them shone brightest in their darkest moments. In the whirlwind of his workaholic life, Uncle Shea still found time to be present for each and every one of us. Whether it was birthdays, naming ceremonies, graduation, award presentation, he never missed an opportunity to celebrate with us. But it was in our darkest hours that his love for us shone brightest. It was in those moments he could be found to bow outside. Soothing our fears and assuring us that the strength that we had within us was far greater than any obstacle the world could throw our way. Lawyer Akutuan Pao was also a member of the legal team who stood in Akufado's corner in the 2012 and 2020 election petitions. And I'm putting it to you further that you are not, the petitioner is not entitled to any of the reliefs that he seeks. And you have no case worthy of hearing before this court. My Lord, I'm done. Partner and head of chambers at the Akufado & Co, where Akutuampao practiced for many years, Alex Queno, 
recounts his contribution to the success of the chamber. He actually gave his work to some of us who were about 10 years in age junior, but who happened to be seniors to vet his work. But soon he was the person to go to, the junior lawyers in particular, to take their work to him to vet, because he will research it. He would not accept anything that you just put on paper. In fact, the juniors in the office, they were always wondering when you'll be a rich man. Because pro bono was his mainstay. It's, it's strange to say this. Pro bono work was Mr. Kutwampa's mainstay. Not charging fees. He didn't know how to charge. Let's put it this way. He didn't know how to charge. So he would just say, I'll take it. Chief Justice Gertrude Araba Tokonu describes him as one who had impacted most lawyers in the legal fraternity. As a lawyer in the courtroom, his processes were always well researched, well articulated, and relevant. Even in the shortest application, when Mr. Kotoan Pao spoke, there was good reason to speak. And what he said added to the proceedings. His work had absolute integrity, and his citations could be relied on. In his human rights activism, many were not happy with him when he took stance against the passage of the anti-LGBTQI plus bill. What is dangerous about this bill is that one single bill mm. somehow manages to breach almost all the fundamental human rights guaranteed mm. under the Constitution. But he was one of those who played instrumental role in the passage of the RTI bill into law for the many so, who have gathered bring, here to remember lawyer Yao Antonia Kutuampao. All they wish is that she say Jenny's Yonder World from the National Theatre here in Accra. My name is James Sabaji for Joy News. And when we are done, may our footprints inspire many more who come after us. And we say, may his soul rest in perfect peace. But that's all we have for you here on the polls on the Joy News channel. I'm blessed to so log on to myjoyonline.com. More stories there for you. Thanks for your company. Bye bye.